Hello and a warm welcome to this edition of Eco at Africa, your European and Pan-African magazine show. My name is Joy Doreen Bira and we're coming to you from the Nairobi National Park here in Nairobi, Kenya. And for those of you who have never seen buffaloes, that's what they look like. Hello, NT. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. I'm Nel Taigwe coming to you from Lagos, Nigeria. We focus on exciting innovations around environmental issues across Africa and Europe. And this is what we have lined up on the show for you today. In Kenya, we will visit the last male northern white rhino. Without him, the species there is doomed to extinction. And we will make a bit of a detour to Switzerland to check out some tiny plastic particles polluting waters all over the world and in South Africa we will find out how growing wine can help to preserve biodiversity in the Cape region. We first head to Kenya to meet a species future generations will probably never see. Poachers have driven the northern white rhino to the brink of extinction. On the black market, its horn is more expensive than gold. By the year 2010, no northern white rhinos were known to exist in the wild. In Kenya, just one male and two females are left on the grasslands of the Alpegeta Conservancy near Mount Kenya. And it looks like they can't have babies. In the shadow of Kenya's second highest peak, Mount Kenya, the Old Pijata Conservancy is a very special nature reserve. Not only because of its abundant wildlife and stunning landscapes, but also because of its three northern white rhinos. Being the last of their kind, they bear the burden of ensuring the survival of the breed. To create the optimum reproductive conditions, all Pijeta left nothing to chance, yet there's little hope. number of uh, mating recorded, unfortunately none has translated into a pregnancy. So we then decided uh, well, the best thing would be to bring in a, a southern white bull and expose that to one of the northern white rhino females. Southern white rhinos are closely related to the northern whites, but the efforts to save northern whites by crossbreeding failed. Biologists have found out that the two remaining females are not capable of reproducing. With the male also incapable of breeding, their extinction seems to be a matter of only a few years. Only 50 years ago, the northern white rhinoceros roamed throughout Uganda, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic. But growing rhino horn demand in China and Vietnam, where it's used in traditional medicine, led to a poaching epidemic. By 1990, just 25 northern white rhinos were left. For Warden Mohamed Doyo, the breed's impending extinction is nearer to his heart than for many of his colleagues at Old Pijata. I don't do this for money. I've loved animals since my school days. I've not done any other work apart from dealing with rhinos. That is what makes me happy. I love them because they are just animals. They are harmless and they don't even talk. Yet they are mistreated and hunted down by poachers. The father of three boys says his relationship to the gentle pachyderms is a very emotional one. I've raised the orphan rhinos whose mothers have been killed by poachers. We've spent the nights with them in the bush. I would spend the night beside her. She had two blankets and had two of my own. When she was hungry, she'd push me with her horn to wake me up, like the way Ashals wakes her father when she wants to pee. So I take these rhinos like my own children. Biologists say northern whites may well be extinct in the next 10 years. So scientists are now turning to high-tech reproductive techniques. They might be the last chance to save them. It's an emerging technique. Uh, we just need to be uh, careful that we have looked at all the risks involved and therefore we can get a signal on when we can start uh, doing that. The method involves creating northern white rhino embryos, which could be gestated by southern white rhino females. But even if the program is successful, it will take decades for the breed to bounce back. 
Until then, the last three of their kind will have to remain under armed protection. South Africa's wine is world famous. Most of the vineyards are within the Cape Flora region. It's a hotspot for biodiversity with over 6,000 endemic species of plants. UNESCO has declared it a world heritage site. But farming, urban sprawl and foreign species are all threatening the Cape's flora. As a result, more than 300 species are on the brink of extinction, according to experts. Can organic wine production be the solution? We went to look for eco-friendly wine on the Cape. The architecture at Warte Kloof is spectacular and modern. The cultivation methods are more traditional. We are a biodynamic farm and we see the whole farm as a living entity, which means not just the vineyard but the fine boss also. Uh, and you want that natural flow of positive energy right through the farm and having your natural vegetation and your natural fauna and flora and their energy enhanced in your vineyards, in your wines, in the whole process is very special and it makes this farm one living entity. Waterkloof is a wine estate on the Cape renowned for its commitment to sustainable farming and winemaking. Farm manager Christian Lutz also uses manure to enrich the soil with microorganisms and to keep pests in check. Chemicals are not part of his repertoire. This farm hasn't used any pesticides or herbicides since 2008. Um, everything uh, that we use comes from the farm. Um, we use uh, the type of fungicides we used is predator fungi, things you find in your compost heap. Christian Lutz has a visitor, Joan Isham from the World Wildlife Fund. In 2008, it declared Varta Kloof a conservation champion. The distinction is only awarded to vineyards that fulfill rigorous environmental criteria. All our conservation champions, there's about 37 of them, they all get um, a formal review every year. And um, that's when I come out to the farms and just want to actually monitor how are they doing with the environmental management. Um, that would include their alien clearing, their fire management. We're also looking at waste management, problem animal control, anything to do with environmental risks on the farm. Waterkloof is one of 600 vineyards in the Cape Winelands. Here the grapes are all picked and processed by hand. The estate makes up to 240,000 litres of wine a year for the domestic market and for export. Christian Lutz takes Joan Isham on a tour of inspection. More than half the 146 hectare estate has been set aside as a conservation area. Instead of vines, endemic bushes and shrubs flourish there. The Feinbos is the natural heathland of the Western Cape. It forms part of the Cape Floral Kingdom, a region with an incredible number of plant species. What's more, two-thirds of the 9,000 species are only found on the Cape. But that's not all. It might happen that one species only occur on one specific farm, nowhere else even in the Western Cape. So if it's lost there and we don't motivate them to look after that species, it will be lost for the world. The greatest threats to the Cape Floral Kingdom are invasive alien plant species, urbanization and farming. Isham says it's very important to get more wine growers on board to become conservation champions. Conservation brings them a range of advantages. We do uh, Feinbos walks um, and we do uh, wine tasting on horseback through the Feinbos. Then there are the biological aspect of it. Natural predators breed in the Feinbos and are available to the vines uh, in spring. So they actually migrate from the Feinbos into the vineyards to control our pests. Isham concludes that environmental management at Warte Kloof is good. You don't see alien vegetation, the alien vegetation there in the distance, they will still deal with, that's a future plan. So we recognize um, their conservation efforts by allowing them to use the little sugar bird Protea logo on their wine bottle. Lutz is passionate about biodynamic farming. He goes way beyond the WWF's criteria for being a conservation champion. Here natural processes do the jobs many farmers assign to machines and chemicals. Sheep graze in the vineyards, reducing the level of weeds between the rows of vines. 
A sustainable farm like this will be around in the next 100 years. Uh, the vines will grow up to 50 years old. Um, my son and so on will still be able to farm this soil because the soil is alive, it's living. Joan Isham hopes to sign up 10 more estates as conservation champions by the end of the year to help ensure a future for both wine growing and the Fane boss.